As part of efforts to kickstart a phased return to normality, authorities here have proposed the temporary adoption of vaccine passes for entry to public venues. Now, the proposal has been met with a bit of controversy, and for more on this conflict, I have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Thank you for having me. I also have visiting Professor An Jin Song, from, also from Yonsei University. It's been a while, Professor An. Thank you. Meanwhile, joining the session virtually is Professor Richard Carpiano at the University of California, Riverside. Pleasure to have you again, Professor Carpiano. Thank you for having me back. Right, first up then, Professor Kim, I understand some 5.8 million people here in the country have yet to register for COVID-19 vaccination. What more can you tell us about them? Well, it's a bit surprising we have that high number. It's the data by the end of September and uh, above among them, only 8.9% are willing to have vaccination. And uh, they are not making an appointment yet. And uh, among those groups, more than 1 billion uh, is over the age of 60, which means they might belong to a high-risk group. And uh, last week, we have a daily uh, average of COVID-19 cases above 2,400. It's still high. And uh, most of the cases who suffered, uh, who got uh, COVID-19, uh, I mean, 92% uh, are not finished their vaccination yet. So that means we have to finish uh, the second shot and spend two weeks to have a, uh, enough immunity to fight against. So I would like to share some data of some Asian countries. And uh, Korea has about 40 cases per million and Japan and uh, India has less than 20 per million, which means uh, only a half of Korean. And Taiwan is less than one case per million. So uh, if you look at the other Western countries, Sweden has about 60 cases per million, Canada and Germany about 100, and uh, USA have more than uh, 300 per million, and the UK has uh, more than 400. But UK and USA are declining right now. Good news is uh, weekly average of Korean data is decreasing slowly. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, good news. And uh, if we pass through these long holidays, I think it will continue to uh, decline. Uh, mortality of COVID-19 has uh, decreased because uh, we better understand about the disease and also we have a vaccine. Uh, but uh, the mortality of unvaccinated patients is three times higher uh, than uh, patients who got vaccinated in Korea. It is about 0.4% uh, in, in uh, unvaccinated people compared to 014 uh, in uh, vaccinated. So why, why is it that? I think uh, why is people do not want to have vaccination? I think they are afraid of uh, side effects. And uh, some might have a bad experience after the first shot of uh, a vaccine. So we have to eliminate the exaggerated uh, information about the side effects. And uh, we must uh, provide an accurate and subjective information what happens after the vaccination. And uh, uh, we have to keep our efforts to find a safe and secure vaccines, especially the new ones is coming soon. Right. And moving forward, Professor Kim, what has been shared then about the gist of the vaccination passes that authorities here in the country are looking to adopt? Well, uh, it's going to be a temporary plan, uh, the way to uh, living with COVID-19. And uh, some foreign countries consider about six months of duration to use this uh, vaccine pass. And our government is saying that the purpose of this uh, vaccine pass will be lower the infection uh, risk for unvaccinated persons and uh, it will not be applied to children. But there are some skeptical uh, views about the effectiveness of this vaccine pass and their dispute on the purpose uh, of this if it is about to boost uh, uh, vaccination rate. Uh, if you look at uh, UK, it's, they have a disagreement uh, within uh, the uh, uh, government. I mean, the security of health and the security of culture are saying a different voice. 
And the Secret of Health is saying that if the vaccine pass is mainly used at the uh, nightclub or some pubs, the effectiveness is very doubtful. Uh, for Korea, uh, our government has already sh shown many efforts to uh, inspect nearly more than uh, about 1 million uh, entertainment businesses uh, since the outbreak to make it sure that uh, they are willing to follow quarantine measures. Uh, whatever kind of vaccine pass to be implemented, uh, we must make it sure that all of us are going to keep the rules and especially in the places with drinkings, singing, dancing in a confined place. Right. And Professor Carpiano, you are currently in Los Angeles and I hear one of the toughest vaccine mandates looks to go into effect there come November 4th. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Indeed. Um, so this builds off of uh, some it takes, uh, falls in the lead of, of several uh, cities already in the United States, uh, namely New York and San Francisco, as well as even some uh, rules in the um, in Los Angeles County, the county in which the city of Los Angeles is located. So, but this is uh, additional and adopted by the city council, rather surprisingly, uh, given United States politics around um, uh, mandates and other sorts of vaccination requirements uh, ra rather uh, overwhelmingly, actually. And so every w it will require everyone who's age 12 and over to be fully vaccinated before entering bars, gyms, restaurants, uh, indoor uh, facilities. Um, and the alternative to that is that um, someone could also uh, provide just a, a negative uh, COVID test within 72 hours of entry to those places in case they have some sort of um, exemption due to religious uh, or, or medical beliefs. Uh, now, the question still remains, though, of course, um, uh, you know, it, there's a high likelihood that this will be uh, be successful. Uh, these uh, There has been uh, uh, really some uh, public uh, sort of support for different types of mandates and requirements. Uh, but the question really does remain, though, to be seen like how well these rules are really going to be enforced. Um, and, and, but overall, it's it really, I think, very good news for because um, Los Angeles is the second largest city in the United States. Right. And before I ask you about your opinion regarding this mandate, uh, Professor Carpiano, how is the public there responding to this mandate in Los Angeles? Well, Los Angeles is, in, in, even for, for California, which is generally seen to be uh, uh, doing doing fairly well in terms of COVID and, and in terms of sort of public attitudes towards public health uh, response relative to some other states in the United States, has, has generally tended to be uh, a bit of a leader uh, in terms of taking more uh, sorts of aggressive uh, actions Towards, uh, towards dealing with COVID than what we've seen uh, more statewide or uh, even in some respects uh, through other states throughout, um, throughout the United States. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, it, it's a thriving economy. It's, uh, you know, again, as I said, the second largest city in the United States. So, you know, really um, anything that is going to be good for public health is going to be good for the economy. A uh, year and a half now into this, people really are looking to get out and, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy some semblance of life uh, what they had uh, pre-COVID. And so really that measures like this, uh, you know, amidst the other sorts of incentives that have been tried out and the other sorts of initiatives to get people vaccinated, um, you know, this is sort of the next step to this. And uh, un unfortunately, uh, particularly as the as the colder months are, are, are approaching, people are gonna be indoors a bit more. These are the, you know, these are the types of measures that uh, that unfortunately uh, that, that we've needed to be t need to take, but still seem to be quite popular even among business owners who um, over on their own have been adopting verification type systems uh, to protect their customers, protect their workers. And so in a way, this uh, in, in essence standardizes it across, uh, across the city. Right. And back here on the local front, Professor Ann, a recent survey shows that two out of every three uh, people who were surveyed, that is, support the adoption of vaccine passes. Now, having said that, what are some of the points of uh, contention with regard to the debate over vaccine passes here? Well, actually, before we talk about the, you know, the, uh, the issues regarding uh, the you know, introduction of the vaccine pass, we need to check the number, you know, just show, you know, briefly. And the, the current vaccine rate uh, for the first shot in Korea is 77%, and for the second shot is about 57%. So if you average of two, it's about six, 67%. And however, the, according to the press, about 92% of the new infection cases is comes from either from the unvaccinated or the first shot only. 
So there's numbers. So let's go back to the uh, survey, actually. If you look at that survey, that about two thirds of the people uh, in favor of the introduction of the vaccine pass is about roughly the same, right? 66, right? So about the same percent. So it means that there's a clear line between the vaccinated and unvaccinated group in Korea. That's kind of concerning because that there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of issue about social inequality issues. And there's, uh, as like the U.S., you know, it's like many people have medical belief or other religious belief then try tend not to take it, you know, the, the shot, right? So that's the issue also, uh, right? So also the concerning is that about the, uh, from legal perspective, you know, since there, kind of possible, there might be a possible discrimination against the the unvaccinated group, which is the minority, right? Because it's one third only, right? Well, less than one third, right? So this, I think there's a, public, a growing concern about the, uh, about the you know, mandate, you know, introduction, the mandatory introduction of the vaccine pass. And the, but the question is that I think it's more important actually that how the government will implement it in detail, right? It's, uh, it's not about the idea about the vaccine pass, right? As an incentive system for the more higher vaccination rate in Korea, right? I think that's more important how we impl implement it. Right. And staying with that, Professor, and as a scholar in the field, what are your thoughts on allegations that vaccine passes violate uh, basic rights? Well, uh, <laughs> well, theoretically, I mean, it's really uh, possibly can infringe on fundamental rights because you, you know, you, you know, infringe on many things. You know, you have right to your own, you know, your body. You know, you, you can choose to make a right, you know, major decisions in your life. Right. Basically, it's a very, very critical issue. But however, I think that it's more like we, if you get the legal perspective is, is very, uh, you know, kind of very concerning. But uh, look at in terms of policy, prescribing policy, maybe we should think about more the uh, focus on persuasion, you know, to get the uh, public consensus, right? For example, I was thinking about some example like, you know, the North Wind and the, you know, North Wind the Sun, the, you know, the, the story about if you, you know, try to get who's stronger, right? Well, you get, it's not about the power and forces, right? It's more like a persuasion. How can you persuade it, the other side, you know, without any, you know, forces, right? So, so I guess that the way I see that the Korean government is very uh, anxious to get higher vaccination rate, you know, very, very quick ways, you know, way for the, in terms of the public, you know, health concern, right? However, you know, to, to get the big picture as a society, all different group individuals, if you think about the minority group, how they think differently and how can we persuade them in getting together as a, you know, so, in one society, one team, right? Right. And staying with that, uh, Professor Carpiano, you, as a, you are a professor of public policy. Where do you stand on the debate over vaccine passes? Yeah, I think they're very good. I think they're very good. I, but I, I would agree that they should not be the uh, the first line of, of action. Uh, they should be used. Uh, um, other other uh, incentives should be used first, uh, and that this is. Uh, but unfortunately, we've kind of gotten to this point of of needing safety in terms of uptake being uh, being inadequate. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, we we have to recognize that you know the vaccine passport. While it might seem um, maybe imposing is really not all that much different than so many other things that we have policies around that require verification. So we need uh, uh, verification to travel. We need uh, evidence of being of uh, adequate age in order to enter a bar, a nightclub, or to purchase alcohol. We need a valid driver's license to operate a vehicle. Uh, so in many respects, the, a vaccine passport um, you know, can, can enable freedoms. It shouldn't be really used, be, be viewed as sort of a burden. Uh, and or if, if so, just a, a, in terms of a minimal burden, and, uh, in terms of thinking about community safety and, and everybody's responsibility for contributing to that. Right. And Professor Kim, from a medical perspective, what is your stance on calls for vaccination verifications to partake in a range of social and professional activities? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the, the Denmark, how did they did with the vaccine pest. I think they're, they're the first country in the EU to start uh, with the vaccine pest pass which started in April and uh, uh, they did the antigen test at the entrance of public facilities and uh, they encouraged vaccination with that and uh, they returned to pre-pandemic uh, uh, on September 10th. So they're actually doing very good. I think they have a geographically advantage as a peninsula to uh, control uh, and quarantine measures. And uh, if you look at Israel, which is the one of the first country in the world to start uh, vaccination with uh, RNA, and uh, they actually they gave some incentives with uh, uh, they call it Green Pass, and uh, 
when the uh, vaccination rate reached about 40 percent, they realized that there is some redundancy and uh, they gave out uh, incentives with that green uh, pass. They had to revive because there was a surge due to uh, Delta variant. And currently, this uh, green pass is valid until the end of uh, 2020. And that means they upgrade it regularly. Uh, and they upgrade the eligibility for green cards, which embedded a QR code, and they check whether they finished the uh, vaccination two weeks before, and uh, they whether check uh, they are recovered from COVID infection, and if it's antibody positive or negative for PCL, which gives a temporary uh, green card. And we have to remember, uh, it is not going to be a perfect measure because COVID-19 spread before symptom and uh, we have a vaccine with asymptomatic infection which transmits. So if we are to have a successful, uh, successful vaccine pass, I think we should uh, have a similar strategy including uh, the things that I mentioned and uh, uh, learn the experience uh, that the other countries have. Right. And speaking about the experience of the other countries, Professor Kim uh, just mentioned, Professor Carpiano, the testing option that people who cannot be vaccinated can have. And this is something you mentioned is also the case over in Los Angeles. But I understand such testing option is not available in New York. In that scenario, then, what other options are there for people to access multi-use facilities? That does become become very difficult, uh, and certainly that can be creating uh, access and, and inequity uh, issues. Um, fortunately, uh, there are um, you know very few. Uh, there's there's a small group of people that would be affected by uh, having some sort of contraindication for the for the vaccine uh, in that regard. And uh, in many cases, and this is starting to become a, a bit more of a of a controversy or a debate in the United States. Uh, is to what extent uh, really that religious uh, exemptions should be allowed uh, to begin with. Uh, is there, uh, while they're based upon personal belief, uh, we also at the same time know that you know, many uh, of the, ma well, the major religions have endorsed vaccination. So that becomes a bit tricky in terms of, uh, uh, of validating those. Uh, and, and, uh, and certainly we're beginning to see um, some some legal uh, um, challenges uh, around those as well. And so, so these are important issues that we do have to consider that, a, uh, a, again, a, a verification system is not going to be perfect. Uh, and at the same time, people who aren't able to be vaccinated, we also have to recognize the fact of that by going out, they are being placed at risk. Uh, uh, for uh, for contracting, and so in in that respect, uh, you know, person who may be uh, under vaccinated or, uh, or or not vaccinated at all, uh, you know, in that case, uh, while that might seem to be um, preventing people from accessing things, uh, can all, it in many instances is also a, an important uh, means for the community to be trying to provide protection for them and and, and their families as well. Right, that is one way of looking at it. And Professor, and what do you propose, I understand this will be a tough question, but what do you propose then to allow for a greater public consensus on the issue of vaccine passes here? Well, actually, I would uh, take some time like, to think about it. The situation is not easy, but I look up the Dan uh, Danish case closely, and uh, there are some lessons we can learn from it, actually. Uh, first thing is that Dan in Danish system, they do not call it the, uh, you know, the, what was that, the, the vaccine pass. They call Corona pass or Corona passport. What's the difference? Well, in terms of a vaccine pass, right, it means, means that, that it's like whether it's a, it depends on your the vaccination status, you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, right? But if you have a like, Corona pass, means that like, a, like the one, the, you know, Israel, right, green pass, something is different, right? So I think that's the one way you need to narrowly tailor or the really get really c very carefully draft the, the policy, how to, you know, have the positive impact to minimize the negative impact from the public, right? Also, the other thing is that the other way is that it's much broader, the scope, right? Uh, as the Professor Kim talked about already, is that uh, three types, right? We might talk about is it vaccinated or the tested positive or negative, I'm sorry, <laughs> negative, right? Also, the, uh, the recover from the disease, right? So it's broader, it's, it's not about so vaccination itself, it's a broader whether you have immunity, right? It's, a, it's an individual immunity, not individual vaccination, vaccination status, right? So I think that's the one key kind of, uh, and then lastly, the, the difference is that, right, US system, right? The, um, 
Right, the difference, right, okay, hash, right, okay, I'm sorry, okay, P right. Okay, I, I think so I very, find very interesting that in the, uh, in the Dan Denmark, right, there's a system that works, and when you get a public place, you know, to get access to like a movie theater or the library, you, have to, you can show your the, uh, pass, right, or you can have the, te the quick test, right, uh, on site. And you have to wait like 20 minutes. Actually, uh, personally, I went to Jeju a conference uh, uh, last summer, actually, and I did the same thing. I have to wait like 10 minutes to get a, a, a PCR test, and a very quick one. So that if you can wait 20 minutes, and can get it. So basically, they do not uh, prohibit the access because it depends on the, your, you know, the vaccination status. You, if you're not vaccinated for your, your medical reason or religious belief, you can wait 20 minutes. And if you are clear, you can get in. I think that's the one kind of positive impact. And then I think they're focused on more like a traveling situation. If you want to go overseas, you have to get vaccinated. I mean, get a pass, right? It's not us, right? So, like, I think it's like finger pointing, blame gaming. Well, it's not us to make you too vaccinated. <laughs> it's the other country make it <laughs> vaccinated because you it's for, you to, you know, for you, it's for you, it's not for us, right? I think that's kind of a public policy, you know, PR issue. I think they put more attention on, close attention to how you get PR in your job on the, you know, vaccine pass right. in Korea. Right. Professor Carpiano, what can you share with us now about cases of forgery, I believe, amid the requirement of vaccine verifications, and how are these um, incidents being tackled in the U.S.? Yes, well, you know, whenever there's a new rule or some sort of regulation that gets enacted, um, there's always going to be some individuals who try to avoid them, uh, and vaccine verification is certainly no exception to that. Uh, so very much like Korea, the U.S. Is, has definitely seen already efforts uh, to produce and distribute fake vaccination certificates. Uh, and the paper certificates, uh, the, the vaccination cards are, are, are a lot easier to fake than, uh, than the digital apps are. And so, um, so we, we you know, definitely see some, some differences uh, with that and how technology um, can, can actually help prevent that. But we also do have laws uh, that exist uh, for dealing with criminal behavior, and, and they're, they're definitely enforced. Um, and but again, you know, technology I think is a way to make it more, much more difficult. Uh, but when it comes to implementing the, the, a passport system like this, I, I think it's important for people to not fall into this trap of what we sometimes call the perfect solution fallacy, uh, which is this false logic that um, just because uh, in this case, uh, you know, fraudulent vaccine records uh, are, are going to be existing and they, they can't be completely prevented, that therefore the, vac the verification system can't be effective in reducing risk and, and improving public health and therefore shouldn't be used. Um, because, I mean, you know, if you think about it, you know, we still require valid age identification to uh, enter a bar or a nightclub, uh, you know, buy, out, buy alcohol, even if we, you know, we, we know that there are youth that are going to try uh, to gain entry using, using false identification, too. So, you know, very much a, a very similar uh, situation holds here as well. Right. A valid thought right there. All right, Professor Carpiano, as always, thank you very much for your insights today. Uh, Dr. Professor An here in the studio, thank, thank you for you. your thoughts. And Professor Kim, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much.